Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 8, to Matthew's Gospel, the 8th chapter. We've been in a series of sermons in the Gospel of Matthew. We continue on in that series this morning. I'd like us to read together Matthew 8, verses 18 through 27. Please follow along as I read Matthew 8, verse 18. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? Let's pray once more. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us us, uh, to know the God-man, Christ Jesus, as he is revealed in your word, which is as he truly is. We pray, Father, that we would all understand better who Christ is, what he calls us to, what his promises are, and what his great power is toward those who believe as we consider this passage. Help us in this, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Most people have uh, personal heroes. I imagine you have personal heroes. I have personal heroes. Uh, There is one hero I have in particular. He's a great preacher and a great theologian. I've never actually met him, but I've admired him from a distance for most of my life. And uh, I have been on a couple of occasions in contexts where I would have had the opportunity to meet him. Uh, In close quarters with him, rooms with him, where he was available to be met or to be talked to if I wanted to talk to him. I had people willing to introduce me to uh, this great hero of mine and to get me some private time with him to talk to him. And uh, I have decided in each of those settings, probably three or four times I think I've been near this man, uh, I decided in each of those settings not to meet him. And one of my friends in one of those contexts asked, well, why don't you want to meet him? Isn't he your hero? Uh, and I just said to my friend, honestly, I said, um, you know, I've heard the old adage, you know, never meet your heroes. Uh, the reason being that so often uh, these men or women that we admire upon closer inspection, some of the shine wears off. I don't expect that to be true of this particular man, but I thought, what if I meet him and he's like having a bad day? <laughs> or what if I meet him, just, it's just not what I was expecting. Uh, and he's short with me or has to go somewhere and that'll always be my memory of my interaction with that man. I was afraid of being disillusioned the more I learned about my hero. Coming out of the Sermon on the Mount in these next two chapters, Matthew 8 and Matthew 9, uh, before the next teaching discourse in chapter 10, remember five big teaching discourses in Matthew, uh, Matthew means to reveal more to us now about the man Jesus. He's going to disclose more information, more exposure, showing us more what Jesus is like. He will reveal to us more concerning his power and authority and his divine sonship and mission. And Matthew does this in chapters 8 and 9 through a series of particularly concise and punchy accounts that capture a great deal of data in relatively short compass. If you read 
in Matthew 8 and 9, it's kind of just like blow after blow, really quick. Of information, quick scenes that reveal a great deal, but before you can even really reckon with what's being revealed, you're on to another scene in these uh, verses. When we read these two chapters together, 8 and 9, we recognize the presentation of the material uh, from Matthew is not linear. Uh, the material is not organized in the way probably you or I would organize it if we had the same material at our fingertips. But as we read Matthew's account, we must remember a few things. First of all, we should of course remember Matthew is operating under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Uh, Matthew is setting this down, we believe, just as God would have him set it down. But secondly, we should also remember Matthew is an ancient writer. And there were different patterns and traditions and methods that regulated how historical accounts like these were to be put together. And those traditions and methods are not exactly in line with how we think about recording eyewitness testimony today. Uh, so as we read chapters 8 and 9, we realize uh, Matthew will toggle back and forth between different themes. There might be a miracle here, and then some quick teaching to his disciples, and then back to another miracle. It's kind of zooming in and out. It's kind of circling around the theme at different times. Uh, these are all literary devices and historical measures and methods uh, to advance the point about Jesus that would have been, I think, well known and well appreciated in the ancient world. Uh, thirdly, we must appreciate, as I've said in the last two messages and in several messages before that, we must understand Matthew is mounting an argument in this gospel. He doesn't tell us everything at once. I mean, sometimes it's like, bam, there it is, like at the end of Matthew chapter 3. Uh, where the Spirit descends upon Jesus in this amazing display at his baptism and the voice of God says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And there's this extraordinary revelatory moment. And then sometimes he's more suggestive. It's sort of like at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of chapter 7, where the crowds are astonished because he spoke to them not as their scribes, but as one who had authority. Well, Matthew's being somewhat subtle. He's trying to give you the sense there's something different about this man. He was not like the others. He's mounting a case and steadily, progressively disclosing to us who the man Jesus is. We're going to see two striking pictures of Jesus' authority in our text this morning in verses 18 through 27. The first has to do with his right to demand total allegiance from his followers. A quite a demand, quite a claim indeed, if true. And then the second with his total command over nature and over storms. Uh, this morning I want us to look at these two short sections, verses 18 through 22, and then verses 23 through 27, and I want us to discern what they teach us about Jesus and what they teach us about being his disciples. So the two main points, I don't have clever headings for you this morning. Point number one, verses 18 through 22. Point number two, verses 23 through 27. Let's look first at verses 18 through 22. Let's read these verses again, please. And when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side, presumably the other side of the Sea of Galilee, by boat. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. In these verses, Jesus, we learn, is surrounded by crowds. Then he determines he's going to leave them and prepares to board a boat and to go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. My assumption is that the two interactions recorded here in these verses happen as Jesus is preparing to depart. So maybe he's waiting for the boat to leave the dock. Maybe he's speaking to them from the boat, but he's preparing to depart. And these two interactions, I think, happen in that context. At least two people, recorded in this passage, speak to him. And the first, we're told, is a scribe. Uh, I just encourage you to remember the scribes were interpreters of the law, teachers of the law. They studied the law meticulously, uh, not just the Old Testament scriptures themselves, but also the commentaries by the various rabbis and others. Uh, they were to be experts uh, in the law and additional laws that were placed uh, beyond the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, that's the first one who comes to Jesus. And this scribe declares, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus responds by saying, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, that's an interesting, uh, if somewhat enigmatic, reply from the Lord. Not what we might expect him to say to someone eagerly saying, Hey, pick me, I'll follow you. I'll follow you wherever you would go. A few things we should note about Jesus' words here. First, I think 
and this is a conjecture, but I think that we're meant to see in Jesus' answer the fact that he, Jesus, discerns something amiss in the scribe's heart. I think Jesus, by his answer, is indicating that this scribe has maybe not counted the cost of following Jesus. Jesus is here penetrating deeper than this man's words and into his heart. And Jesus can see there in this man's heart, I think, that he's not truly ready and willing to follow Jesus. But now looking at the statement itself, what is Jesus meaning by this enigmatic statement? There are two things I think we can draw from this meaning. First of all, I think this statement, uh, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, I think it's probably literally true. We know it's true of the foxes, they have their holes, the birds have their nests. I think it's true that Jesus is saying, I don't have a place to lay my head. Uh, We know that Jesus carried on an itinerant ministry largely away from his own city and away from the halls of Jewish prestige and power. Uh, He was something of a rabbi in exile. There's a reason why his ministry is taking place largely in the north country and not in his home city. Uh, He's not accepted among the religious establishment. Moreover, he probably was genuinely homeless, uh, going from place to place as he performed his signs and wonders and as he carried on his teaching and might lodge here and there uh, along the way. But secondly, and I think this is the larger point, I think this statement in concise and compact language is making a larger point about the nature of discipleship. That is what it means to follow Jesus. A disciple is uh, a student of a teacher, a servant of a master, a follower of a Lord. I think there's something being revealed here about the nature of discipleship. Jesus is in essence saying by this sort of kind of proverb that following me is costly. Following me is not the pathway to health, wealth, and prosperity in this life. Following me will require you, if you're serious about following me, to accept sacrifice, uh, to accept opposition, to accept loss and self-denial for my sake. Simply put, Jesus is telling would-be disciples to count the cost. Well, we have no account of how the scribe responded. We just move immediately to a second uh, person, a second interaction that Jesus has with an individual. Again, the focus being on following Jesus and the cost following him entails. We read in verse 21, another of the disciples said to him, notice this man is identified as a disciple. And we may wonder, is this one of the 12 that spoke to him? Uh, Probably not. The word disciple is used in very different ways in the Gospel of Matthew at different times. Sometimes it denotes those who are truly following Jesus and have committed their lives to him. Sometimes it means those who might have kind of just been following him out of general interest and things like that. You should not assume every time you see the word disciple in Matthew, it is referring to a genuine, bona fide, committed follower of Jesus. I would suspect this person is probably someone who has been following Jesus around with some interest. He has listened to him, he has observed some of his miracles, and he has some genuine interest in following Jesus. But I suspect he was something short of a bona fide member of the kingdom of heaven, and one who had truly embraced Jesus for all that he is. This person says to Jesus, Lord, let me first go and bury my father, presumably in response to the call to follow Jesus. And Jesus says to him, follow me, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. I take Jesus to mean by that, uh, let the spiritually dead go and bury the physically dead. You follow me without any delay. Uh, Now that is a pretty stark response. Uh, It almost sounds harsh to our contemporary ears. Jesus, really? This man wants to bury his father? Can't you allow him the time and the space? To see after this very noble thing, after all, does it, the commandment say to honor your father and your mother? And now in his father's death, he wants to honor him by burying him. What could be amiss with that? It sounds harsh to us. What should we make of what Jesus says? Well, again, I think we're to understand that Jesus knew more about this man's heart than what is immediately discernible by the man's words. I think Jesus sensed in the question of this so-called disciple that he is somehow holding back from giving himself entirely to Jesus. This man's desire to bury his father represents a conflict of allegiances. He has the incarnate son of God before him, Israel's Messiah, 
and yet he is allowing a family obligation, however important, to delay his service to Jesus. The bottom line is something else is taking priority over Jesus' commands. And again, that might seem harsh. That might seem radical, right? But I hope this would be true. I was thinking of this myself. Like if I felt the need to bury my own dad, like he just died, I'm grieving, I need to go bury my father, and Jesus says this to me, what would I do? Well, you know, I, I thought to myself of the day I married my own wife. Uh, you might imagine we just witnessed Caleb and Lydia get married. It was a joy to witness their wedding, and Caleb is standing here at the altar at the front, and, and he's getting ready to see his bride. She's going to come down. They're going to be wed. I was in that same spot waiting to see my bride. But if just before my bride came down the aisle, someone came to me and whispered to me, uh, Alex, Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God, is standing in the parking lot. As much as I had been anticipating my entire life of seeing my bride walk down the aisle, no offense, babe, but I'm going to go and see Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is before me. He's here. The Lord is here. There's nothing however urgent, however meaningful to me that could rival being with the Lord. Well, I think what Jesus is doing here, he's not trying to tell us it's wrong to honor our parents. He's not trying to tell us that it's wrong to, to, to bury our parents, uh, to be with those who are grieving. He's not trying to say that at all. I think he's trying to set it by a radical contrast. Even something as great as this does not rival my demands, my claim on your life, the importance of my presence with you. I think that's the larger point that Jesus is making. He is saying nothing and no one gets priority over Jesus and his calling on my life. Okay, coming out of verses 18 through 22, I want to share a few lessons for us, three lessons in particular. First of all, we should just observe simply, we're going to see this at other times in the gospel. Number one, not everyone who professes to follow Jesus truly ends up following him. But not everyone who professes to follow Jesus truly ends up following him. We should not be shocked by this. I think the Bible, the Lord, prepares us for this. Uh, many who make a positive response to Jesus and even profess to follow Jesus in the end do not truly follow him. They have not counted the cost. They have not surrendered all. When they are tested, when Jesus requires them to give up something that's precious to them, they withdraw from him. Or they continue to uh, pretend to love him and to follow him when really in their hearts they do not. Oh, we're going to learn more about the spiritual dynamics at work here in this kind of thing. When we get to Matthew 13, uh, there we read about the parable of the sower. And we see that actually many people make a positive response to Jesus. Not all of them truly follow Jesus. Not all of them have truly embraced Jesus and counted the cost. This kind of thing will happen. Number two, second lesson. Jesus requires complete and total allegiance from his disciples. In following Jesus... Friends, we are all called to count the cost. And Jesus requires nothing short of total allegiance to him. There is no other way to follow Jesus than to give him everything. You cannot be halfway with Jesus. You can't be kind of one foot in with Jesus and one foot in the world. We're going to see again and again, Jesus is going to require total, absolute allegiance. Total, absolute commitment. You give me everything. Your heart, your life, your hopes, your dreams, everything. And this may sometimes become painful for us. It will at times mean leaving father or mother or son or daughter. It will sometimes mean alienation and estrangement from friends and loved ones. It will sometimes mean persecution, reviling and hostility from the world. Even as I look out in this congregation, I know some of you have experienced this. For Christ's sake, following Jesus will come at a cost. But friends, the good news is Jesus is worthy of our full allegiance. No one who gives themselves fully and totally to Jesus Christ will in the end regret it. He is worthy of everything. He is worth every cost. And when you follow him, you will steadily begin to realize I gave up nothing and I gained everything. Friends, we're meant to experience and come into Christ the total self-giving of our hearts to Jesus. Now, can you imagine this? Those of you who are married, uh, being in a marriage relationship where you're kind of half in, half out. Uh, so it, you get half my time, uh, half my money. Uh, I'll spend sort of half the time with the kids. You spend the other half. No, of course, we recognize in marriage, there's supposed to be the total self-giving to the other. And marriage is dreadfully cheapened. 
If it's something short of that, if we're not giving ourselves wholly to the other person, that's the glory and the beauty and the wonder of marriage. Well, similarly, in coming to Jesus Christ, it's meant to be total. Faith is a whole-souled commitment to Jesus Christ, to give him everything and to hold nothing back. And that is what Jesus is showing us here. Give me your all. Entrust to me your heart. Entrust to me everything. And you will find that it was all worthwhile. Uh, third lesson here on these first five verses. In following Jesus, his priorities must take precedent over our own. Uh, his priorities must take precedent over our own. Indeed, we could say his priorities must become my own. I am to surrender everything to Jesus. I am to surrender to him my agenda, my hopes for my life, my money, my family, my time, my marriage, my kids, my plans and ambitions. His kingdom, his commands, and his concerns now determine my priorities. His priorities become my priorities. And this is meant to get very practical for each one of us. It is to inform the way we make decisions in life. It is to inform the patterns and habits of our lives. It is to inform the way we spend our time and the way we spend our money, the way we use our resources, the way we order our days. I just ask you, brother or sister, uh, do your priorities week by week reflect something of your commitment to Jesus Christ? Uh, is Christ's agenda our agenda? Would anyone tell by looking at how we spend our time and how we organize our lives that we have given ourselves wholly over to another whom we follow and whom we worship? Recently, I was talking to a young woman who was talking about her testimony. And she was talking about a, a critical point where she realized, you know, no one would tell by looking at my life or about my agenda and my plans and my ambitions and all that, uh, that I have any real relationship with Jesus, that I'm committed to him, that I'm following him sort of a wake-up call to her. Have I really given myself to Christ? I want my priorities to reflect his priorities. I want to give myself wholly to him, and I want it to mold and shape my life at a practical level. All right, let's move on now to the second main heading, the second several verses in our text. Let's consider now verses 23 through 27, connected to what we saw before, but different in terms of some of the lessons we learn. Follow along as I read verses 23 through 27. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this? that even winds and sea obey him. Jesus gets into the boat with his disciples, and they begin to make their way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. At some point, apparently, Jesus goes to sleep, presumably in the hull of the ship. That would be in the kind of lower regions of the vessel. And while he is sleeping, we read, there arose a great storm. Now we know, spoiler alert, who ordered the storm. We've already seen Jesus can command the cells in a man's body from miles away. He can undo disease. We've seen already that he knows men's thoughts before they even share them. He is omniscient, that is, he knows all. Omni, shunt, everything, knowledge. And he is omnipotent, that is, he is all-powerful. And that will be revealed again in this text, in this instance. A great storm arises and it's threatening to overwhelm the ship. There's thunder, we should imagine. There's lightning, waves are crashing down upon the boat. The wind is howling, the boat is rising and falling. But now notice this in verse 24, we read, The boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus was asleep. Now I wonder, have you ever actually been on a boat in the midst of a storm that is threatening to overturn the boat and shipwreck the crew. Well, neither have I, but I have seen it portrayed in movies. It's utter chaos. It's bedlam. The boat is rocking and reeling. You're going up and down and rocking from side to side. There's noise and chaos and commotion. Normal people can't sleep on a boat that's going under. That's just like not possible. 
But we read Jesus is asleep. Like how? How is Jesus sleeping on a boat that's about to be, we understand, shipwrecked? Jesus is asleep in the middle of the storm because he, as the God-man, is commanding every wave and every gust of wind. He's conducting the storm like a symphony, even as he sleeps. Jesus is never subject to unforeseen forces. He is the forcer of forces. The incarnate Son of God sleeps in the storm because he planned the storm from before the world began. And as the dual natures of God and man are brought together in one person, he can both rule the winds and the waves and sleep in perfect peace. The second reason he could sleep is because he, unlike his disciples, has perfectly entrusted himself to God. He is not afraid like the disciples. He knows his father. He knows his father will not abandon him. He knows the plans that his father has for him. He has perfect trust. And therefore, he doesn't feel fear and anxiety in the face of what appears frightful. No, Jesus is calm, serene, and composed in the face of the storm. While others are panicking, he is enjoying a cat nap in the midst of the storm. Friends, I'll just say briefly here, it would be better for us in the midst of our storms if we were all more like Jesus. Perfect trust, total dependence. Well, Jesus is asleep in the hall, and as he sleeps there, his serene, peaceful, quiet, composed posture there is to be contrasted to some degree with the disciples who are running down, running up and down on the deck of the ship, you know, screaming, you know, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, we're gonna die. What are we going to do? They're freaking out. Jesus is sleeping in the hall. His disciples are afraid and they think they're perishing and that this is the end. They are afraid, listen, because their eyes are on the lightning and the black clouds and the mounting waves. They are afraid because all they can see is the storm. But in the midst of their fear, as things get desperate, notice they go to the Lord. And they say in verse 7, save us, Lord, for we are perishing. At some point in their panic, apparently they look to the Lord. And they appeal to him. They beg him, Lord, save us from this disaster. Jesus responds by saying, why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. But Jesus responds by questioning their fear and their weak faith. Inherent in his question is the assumption that they have no need to be afraid if he is with them. And notice the connection he draws between fear and faith. They had fear, but they ought to have had faith. Where faith should have ruled, fear reigned. And Jesus, in effect, says there is no reason to be frightened, no reason to be afraid. And had you more faith, my brothers, you would see this. There is no reason to fear. Now, as I read this account and other accounts in the Gospels of Jesus calming the storm and speaking to his disciples about their lack of faith and their need not to be afraid, I wonder, and you may wonder, how did Jesus say this to them? You know, how did this come across? You know, why are you afraid, oh, you have little faith? Was it a stinging rebuke? What's the matter with you? What are you, what are you worried about? Don't you have faith in me? You have little faith. Have you not been with me long enough to appreciate who I am? You disgust me. Get out of the way. Let me handle this. Do we think it came in that way? Uh, or was it more like the way I spoke to my son last summer as he was learning how to swim? If you taught a kid to swim, you hold the kid. And at some point, you got to let him go. And he does good for three seconds. Does the thing. And then he starts going under, and he starts panicking. He grab him back. Okay, let's try to go a little longer this time. And you let go, and oh, now it's six seconds. And... But then he starts to panic. And, and what do you say to your son? My son, there, there's no reason to be afraid. Dad's right here. Don't you trust me, son? Be not afraid. I'm here. I think it's probably more the latter. 
in terms of how Jesus spoke to his disciples. In the parallel account in John 6, Jesus comes to them in the storm and says, It is I. Do not be afraid. Well, we read then in verse 26, He rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. With a word from Jesus, everything changed. Everything is well. Verse 27, and the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this? That even winds and sea obey him. Now what's happening here at the end of this section? Why does Matthew, clever writer that he is, end the section with this question? Well, friends, I think he's, of course, being suggestive. Matthew remembers continuing to mount his argument about the man Jesus. And this is just another plank in that argument. The one descended from Abraham and David, chapter 1. The one whose birth fulfilled ancient prophecy, chapter 2. The one over whom the Father himself speaks the benediction and upon whom the Spirit of God rests, chapter 3. The one who triumphed when tempted in the wilderness where Israel failed, chapter 4. The one who speaks with an authority greater than the scribes and greater than Moses, chapters 5 through 7. The one who heals lepers, heals people with simply a word from miles away, chapter 8. And now the one to whom even the waves and winds must answer. Those ancient symbols of chaos and disaster. What sort of man is this? And of course, again, spoiler alert, we know who he is. He is the Son of God. He is Israel's Messiah. He can command nature because he is nature's maker. Uh, John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is the one who was asleep in the hull. And this is the one who rebukes the winds and the waves. What we know well through the full revelation of God's word concerning Jesus Christ the Son and through also our own Christian experience with him was just beginning to dawn on these men. What sort of man is this? Even the winds and the waves bow to his command at a word. Okay, friends, a few lessons, four lessons here, and then we'll be done. Four lessons we learn from verses 23 through 27. First of all, we learn Jesus' disciples will pass through storms in this life. Jesus' disciples will pass through storms in this life. Becoming the Lord's disciple does not shield us from storms, apparently. Again, like we saw in the last section, uh, following Jesus is not the pathway to health, wealth, and prosperity in this life. Brothers and sisters, we will face storms like these disciples. And sometimes the waves and the winds will appear threatening. And at times we will begin to fear that we're going under and that we're going to perish. It's possible that these disciples, that they thought when they first began to follow Jesus that it would all be smooth sailing from then on. Friends, that is not Christ's promise. But Christ does not promise us freedom from life's storms. He actually promises the opposite. He says, in this world you will have tribulation. Christians are subject to storms just like everyone else. They may come in the form of a health crisis, Financial pressure, the premature death of a loved one, a car crash, an embattled marriage, a wayward child, debilitating illness, a crisis of faith, a church split, the betrayal of a friend, crippling depression, overwhelming anxiety, and numerous other storms like these. Some of you right now at this instant are going through intense storms. 
My friend, I just want to say to you this morning in light of this passage, don't be dismayed or surprised as though something unforeseen is happening to you. And please don't conclude Christ has forsaken you. That Christ has abandoned you or left you. You are not abandoned. Jesus prepares us for storms. He tells us all of his disciples will pass through storms. And sometimes the storms will threaten to undo us. Christian, don't be surprised when things appear to go ill and when your path meets with trial and tribulation. Jesus means to prepare us to face such storms and to reveal things to us in the midst of these storms. Lesson number two. Fear drives out faith and faith drives out fear. Fear drives out faith. Faith drives out here. Many have noted this dynamic, the relationship between faith and fear. Jesus said, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? We're meant to see a connection between these two things. I think mathematicians call that an inverse correlation. As one goes up, the other goes down. The more fear we have, fear tends to crowd out faith. And faith inversely crowds out fear. One of the reasons we struggle so much as Christians with fear is because we struggle so much with faith. When our faith runs low, our fears rise. When we are afraid, we are looking only at the mounting waves. We're looking only at the black clouds and the lightning. And we feel the wind and the driving rain in our faces. And our fears, all of a sudden, like these disciples, begin to overwhelm us. We lose our grip on our lives and on our circumstances. And we start to catastrophize. I hope you do. I know I do. When things look frightening. And we think, what if this happens or that happens? What if things never get better? What if this is my state in my life forever? What if he never changes or she never changes? What if I never have that thing that I think I so badly need? And we become afraid and we become consumed by our fears. And what's happening? All the while, as the greatness of what is fearful and frightening grows in our eyes. Uh, Faith is sort of crowded out. Faith retreats. Well, friends, the same dynamic is true of faith. As our faith grows, fear is crowded out. Where there is robust and abiding trust in Jesus, fear begins to cower. It begins to diminish. It appears to retreat as we have larger faith in God. Well, of course, the goal then is to move from fear to faith. I think that's a book by Martin Lloyd-Jones. He has a short commentary on Habakkuk, Moving from Fear to Faith. Well, how does one do that, though? Because I don't want to be afraid. I am afraid, but I don't want to be afraid. How can I move from fear to faith? And this is how. It comes by getting more caught up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes by knowing him better, understanding his precious promises better. Coming to appreciate his gospel more and more. Being more attuned to his heart and to his nature. Becoming so familiar with Jesus. He rises so much in your estimation that what appears frightening begins to retreat and diminish in the face of our great Lord. It's not unlike the little boy paddling in the water learning how to swim. What does that boy need? He needs to know he's safe in the arms of his dad. And if he can appreciate, dad's here. Dad's with me. Dad would never allow something harmful to befall me. Dad would never allow me to sink under. I don't need to be afraid. As the little boy's estimation of dad rises, that which appears fearful begins to diminish. I can remember being in a a counseling session with a a married couple. This is a number of years ago now. And uh, the wife was struggling. She she had a, a difficult background struggling with fears over um, what if my husband leaves me one day? That was the fear. What if he leaves? Now, he had never given any reason to think that he would leave. He had been a loving husband. And, but there was this, there was this fear, and, and she would see other things happen, and she'd think, well, what if that happens here? And one of the things a, a wise pastor in the room said, not me, another brother that was there, uh, he said, uh, sister, you know your husband. You know your husband. He's been married for many years. Uh, He's proven himself trustworthy. He loves you. He's committed to you. 
what he was doing in that moment was trying to help her see there's grounds for trust here. There's a marriage here. There's children that have been born in this marriage. You, you know your husband. You can trust him. Well, what we need, friends, when we look out at the storms of our life and all that seems frightening to us, when we see all that would threaten to undo us, what we need to do is appreciate better who the Lord is, what his will is for us, and that as long as he is in the ship, the ship is safe. He will see us through the storm. He has the power to command the storm with the word. He's not surprised by the storm. He's over it all, and he wants to calm and soothe our fears by showing us more of his heart and who he is in the midst of all that seems frightening. Third lesson, Jesus is patient with our fears and our weak faith. Jesus is patient with our fears and our weak faith. Jesus comes to us in the context of our fears, and he seeks to relieve them tenderly. He does this gently. He does this lovingly. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't give up on us. Jesus doesn't harangue us. He doesn't say, well, come back to me when you have better faith. Come back to me when you've gotten a grip. No. Friends, that's not how Jesus is with his disciples who find themselves afraid. Jesus is sensitive with our fears, our shortcomings, and all the ways we might disappoint him. He is patient with us. And he means to reassure us and to help us sweetly to move from fear to faith. And he is willing to save us from perishing. He won't allow it to happen. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. He seeks to reassure us that we can trust him for everything. He wants to prove again and again that we have no reason to be afraid. Friends, he is with us and he can make us well. Christian, in the midst of your fears, I would encourage you, do not imagine Jesus as stern and severe and frankly a little annoyed at you. No, Jesus is like the tender husband, the loving father, the gentle shepherd, the meek and lowly savior. He says to you, oh, my child, there is no need to be afraid. I'm here. I'm here. You can trust me. Fourth and final point, fourth and final lesson. Jesus commands all the waves and winds of our lives. Jesus commands all the waves and winds of our lives. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the creator, the ruler, and the sustainer over all. Jesus creates the universe and rules it by his sovereign power, which means he has command over the sky, over the wind, and over the waters. He has command over the storms of this life. If the seas of life become rough and the winds become strong, it is surely by his ordering and by his design. Imagine the disciples and their discovery. He was over it all. He commands the winds and the waves. When, when we thought we were going under, he was in control the whole time. And with a word, he could tell the storm to arise and he can rebuke it. Imagine their discovery when all was calm. My Jesus is in control. Brother, sister, there is not a single trial a single tribulation, a single sorrow, a single storm that is outside of Jesus' control. He is over it all. And I want to be clear as I say that, I'm not just saying he allowed it. People will sometimes, when bad things happen, well, oh, Jesus allowed that. As if that somehow exculpates God. He allowed it. That provides some sort of comfort to us. No, I'm trying to say a good bit more than that. Friends, the storms of our lives are by Jesus' design. He is doing something in our storms. Christ ordains everything in our lives. 
These things, friends, are from the Lord's hand. They are all under his providence. Are you here this morning and you have financial hardship? Do you have a difficult spouse? Do you have unbelieving children? Are you experiencing opposition from family? Do you carry with you a debilitating condition or disorder that you would do anything to be rid of? Do you see the ones you love suffering around you with no ability to help them? Do you face uncertain and frightful prospects in your future that appear threatening to you? Is there something in your life, something that's before you, something that's looming and you think, oh God, please, not that. Anything but that. A diagnosis, the results of the test, the outcome of a painful situation, the abandonment of a loved one, your own looming death. Friends, all of these things are under the sovereign rule of Christ. Storms don't just happen by accident. Christ is over them all. And listen to me, until you make peace with that truth, you will be hopelessly unstable. And your life will be disoriented as you try to reconcile what's happening in my life and what God says in his word. The ground under your feet will become a sinking sand. No, friends, let's settle this in our minds. There is no trial, no hardship, no disappointment, no storm in this life that is outside of the control of the Lord Jesus. Never forget that. Some of us find ourselves in the midst of extremely difficult circumstances. And we must remember this is by Jesus' design. My Jesus is doing something in this. It's not like Jesus, you know, slipped up. He has never said, oops, never had an accident. No, he's over this storm. And brother, sister, he means for you to pass through the storm. The waters rise and the waves crash at his command. And listen, I know that for many of you, as I say that, the realization of that may confound you. But friends, does it also comfort you? My Lord, who only and always has my good at heart, is over this. He only and always has my good at heart. He tells me that in his word. We confess it together. Not a hair can fall from my head apart from the will of my Father who is in heaven. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Paul says in Romans 8, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We believe that by faith and not by sight. Is it a comfort to you to know this trial, this storm that has befallen me, it comes from the hand of one who loves me and who has never for a second had anything other than my eternal good at heart. My friend, he knows what you're going through. He knows. He commands the storm. He knows right now what you're going through. He has not forgotten about you. And he will not fail you. He intends to help you persevere through the storm. And no wave will crash over you that he doesn't intend for your good. Jesus says to each breaking wave, you may come this far and no further. And you will stop as soon as you have fulfilled my designs in the life of the one following me. Brothers and sisters, the winds will die down and the waters will become calm. And you will reach the safety of the shore not a moment sooner than he intends. And the storms will last only as long as he wills in order to fulfill his good purposes in you. Be still, my soul. Thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul. The waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. J.C. Ryle writes, there are waves of trouble 
far heavier than any of the lake of Galilee. There are days of darkness which try the faith of the holiest Christian. But let us never despair if Christ is our friend. He can come to our aid in an hour when we think not and in ways that we did not expect. And when he comes, all will be calm. All will be calm. Jesus will make all things well. And friends, he will come. He will not let you perish. He won't let you go under. He's standing by to rebuke the waves and winds when they have fulfilled their purpose. Charles Spurgeon was a man of many sorrows. He knew many trials and afflictions. Eight of his siblings died in infancy. When he arrived in London, he had unjust and severe censure heaped upon him in the newspapers. He just had to bear it, couldn't defend himself. He suffered severely from chronic kidney disease, debilitating gout. He labored much of his adult life under bouts of severe depression. His wife would say she'd often find him weeping at the foot of the stairs, and he couldn't even tell her the reason why. He had to watch his wife suffer from some unknown condition that left her homebound most of their marriage. They rarely went to church together. She couldn't make the trek. In the latter years of his life, he knew the betrayal of some of his closest friends. Spurgeon passed through storms. But Spurgeon, by the grace of God, was brought to see the Lord's hand in these storms. And with this in his mind, he said to his congregation on a Sunday in 1881, I, the preacher of this hour, beg to bear my little witness that the worst days I have ever had have turned out to be my best days. And when God has seemed most cruel to me, he has then been most kind. If there is anything in this world for which I would bless him more than for anything else, it is for pain and affliction. I am sure in these things the richest, tenderest love has been manifested towards me. Our Father's wagons rumble most heavily when they are bringing us the richest freight of the bullion of his grace. Love letters from heaven are often sent in black-edged envelopes. The cloud that is black with horror is big with mercy. Fear not the storm. It brings healing in its wings. And when Jesus is with you in the vessel, the tempest only hastens the ship to its desired haven. Blessed be the Lord whose way is in the whirlwind. And who makes the clouds to be the dust of his feet. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we confess to you that we are often afraid. Well, we find the storm clouds around us and the mounting waves terrifying to us. Many of us here could testify right now. There's something standing in front of me and it frightens me. Lord, we know that there has never been a moment when you have failed us in your providential care. You are over everything that comes into our lives. Uh, Lord, you were in control over the storm that arose that day in Matthew 8. You were over the storms of our lives. We know this. We understand this. But Lord, we're still afraid. We still become frightened. We still lose our way. We still falter. And sometimes, Lord, it feels like we're going under and we're perishing. 
we need a sympathetic Savior who draws near to us, not in rebuke, but in comfort. There is no need to be afraid. I am with you. Father, we pray for all of us who are afraid. You would come to us and speak such comfort to us. We pray that your promises and your gospel would loom larger in our eyes than those storm clouds that frighten us. Fill our view and our gaze with Jesus such that the winds and the waves are crowded out. And we could abide in greater faith that you are over it all, that you will see us through, and that with a word our Jesus is able to rebuke those winds and waves and to bring about total, perfect stillness and calm. Deliver us, Lord, for we are afraid. Come to our rescue and make us well. Enlarge our faith to lay hold of you and to know that as long as you are in the vessel, we're safe. Please do this in all of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.